I really like being able to see how things flow from one department to each other, how the story evolves, because the story pretty much gets rewritten with every department you go into, it moves into. And I like being part of uh, developing the workflow and the pipeline the processes. Um, so, you know, like I said, I'm always asking myself that question, even on here we are when I came in and picked up someone else's legacy, I was still, you know, trying to figure that out and trying to make suggestions of what worked and what didn't and just improve that. I, I, th I, I like problem solving. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to Screen Skills Stepping Up to Production Management panel discussion. So now I'm going to hand you over to Sue Ann Rochester, who will be able to introduce you to herself and our wonderful panel and lead a, a brilliant conversation. Thank you, Abigail. Hi, I'm Sue Ann Rochester. I am the Managing Director of um, Wild Child Animation in Stirling, and I also run the Scottish chapter of Animated Women UK. I'm really excited to have been asked to do this. Um, always up for a panel so that's good um, and also to get to meet some uh, amazing production managers around the UK so it's yeah really really interesting chat this afternoon um, so I'm going to hand over to them to introduce themselves individually so, so Tamsin if you want to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from um, Hi um, I'm Tamsin Clayby um, I started off for my career um, in a very different way to most I think animation professionals. Um, I didn't start off in animation, um, I was in HR and finance and um, I moved into animation into the production manager role um, with funding from Creative Skillset um, who were trying to at the time enhance the, um, the industry skills. Uh, I um, moved into the role and uh, worked in a few on a few different um, TV series and have since worked in VFX in some commercials. Um, I was in London for many years and have moved down to Bristol. So I'm now at a small company called Wildseed, which is just lovely. And I was at Ardman for a little while last year, which is where we one of the other panel, um, where we did a music video together for Coldplay. Um, and yeah, really interested to, to hear um, the questions from you guys and what the other panel members are going to say. Omari? Hey, thanks. Um, uh, my name's Omari. I'm um, 28 from Birmingham and I'm a Pisces, so nice to meet all of you. I'm a product, company production manager at uh, Kids Cave Studios. I've been in the industry for about, uh, I think this is my seventh year now, uh, and I've bounced around. I've, I've kind of been all over the place. Um, let's see, uh, Tiger Aspect, um, Studio AKA, um, Jellyfish Pictures, briefly at Blink, Blink Inc, uh, Passion Pictures, then Lupus Films, Axis Studios, and now uh, Kids Cave. I've been around and that's pretty much exclusively in kids TV uh, across 2D and uh, CG shows. And yeah, happy to be here. Uh, Rob? Hi there, I'm, uh, I'm Rob Franklin. I am the Senior Production Manager at Gutsy Bristol. Uh, a little like Tamsin, I, I, I got into production management through a slightly circuitous route. I started out my career at um, Disney as a promo producer which is a lovely little entry into the into the media industry because it was a little bit of everything so it's quite a nice way to get a taster of, of what this industry is like. Um, I then moved over to animation so I have spent most of my career as uh, uh, watching cartoons as I like to say but um, at, uh, at um, Ardman in New York, I worked um, on various short form commercial campaigns. Uh, the biggest one was, uh, was a national campaign for the NBA. Um, but I also worked on some, some uh, other, uh, still keeping a toe in pro promos for Nickelodeon when I was working there and uh, glamorous things like head lice treatment. <laughs> and then um, moved back to Britain, um, worked at the Bristol office with Townsend on the Coldplay video. And um, yeah, I've, I, I, I then took the dive into, into long form programming and uh, here I am at Gutsy Bristol. So nice to meet you all. Beverly. Hi, uh, my name is Beverly Young. I studied animation and I've been in the industry for five years. I've worked across TV series uh, while I was on Cartoon Network, while I was at Cartoon Network and at Passion Pictures. I've also been across mini series, Watership Down, and short films at, while at Studio AKA. Right now, I'm a production manager on a t 2D TV series at Dog Years. Fantastic. 
So have you, have you actually started your new job, Beverly? It was only a few days we spoke and it was your last day. <laughs> started today, how exciting. Oh, love a new job. Um, uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so we've got a range of questions. Uh, I think you've, you've mostly answered question one already, which is the journey to your current job. Um, but I think it's fascinating already to hear that there is no direct route like everybody goes from you know you can go on a tangent you can start your production manager role at any point of your career and I think that's what's so exciting about our industry so hopefully everyone listening can get something uh, from that in itself so um, one uh, one thing it would be really good to talk about is the actual production manager role and the difference between coordinator to production manager because that's the usual it's the the traditional route that everyone expects to go through don't they production assistant coordinator and then to production manager so it'd be good to hear what you think the difference is between the role so that people can you know if they're trying to upskill or want to get some training to move in that direction what would you uh, say that they need to know and learn to get there so let's start with rob maybe yeah that that, that is the the usual route and I, I, my biggest advice that, that if, if anyone to, were to ever ask is um, to get as much experience across as much of the production as you possibly can because I think as a coordinator you can often be siloed you could you, you have your own little world that you that you coordinate yourself but you may not have a, a vast amount of experience in some of the other aspects of the production and I think that when you're moving up into production management the idea then is that you have a much broader um, overlook of the production as a whole you're managing the coordinators so you've got to sort of build that management um, experience up um, and you've got to kind of be it's, it's sort of on you to be uh, the uh, in the know and kind of the expert on most of the aspects of a production even if um, even if it's um, working with the most talented people to get to get the information um, I, I, I just think getting as much experience across as, as many different aspects is one of the most one of the most important things. Um, I was just going to say I think um, a really important um, part of moving from being a production coordinator to a production manager is just to remember to to ask as many questions as you want to be asking. Um, it's okay to to not already know anything. Um, and um, I think I, I definitely benefited from that, from having not come through um, you know, the animation degree process. Um, I wasn't embarrassed about asking, particularly the CG supervisors for the first two series <laughs> that I worked on, a lot of questions every day. Um, and that often involved buying lots of lunches to <laughs> just to get a lot of information out of people about their experience and just try and learn from, from other people's situations as well as learning from your own experience. Um, because as as rob says you know if you've worked on one or two productions as a as a production coordinator production producing what just one de, um coordinating just one one department then you might be an expert in that but you might not know about the other areas of the process um and uh, being the production manager you really need to have um quite a broad understanding from what to look for in a script going into the storyboard, going through it from storyboard into animation and what the implications are going to be for some of those decisions going through to lighting and comp, more for CG than, than for 2D where I'm currently working. But I think it's really important um, to, to, see, to be able to gradually start to see what, how the flow of information goes through, through the processes. And that's, that's really something that you learn with experience, but asking questions all along the way and questions of all of the heads of departments um will be more available to you um the more you've built up those relationships and investing time in those relationships is is absolutely key uh, I, I think uh, relationships is 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 a kind of a half part of uh the follow-up to this question so amari it'd be interesting to hear what you because uh, coordinating is is a lot about the pieces of the puzzle isn't it you're you're tracking things you're you're filtering information to people but then how how much more in production management is there about people skills and managing people and relationships um it, do you find that that's a, a bigger part of the role a bigger change yeah uh, that's for me yeah yes okay yeah uh, definitely definitely um i think it's like um, tamsin and, and and rob said uh, i think as a coordinator i was 
much very much departmental but now i'm across the whole show uh, i'm looking at things at a higher level and um yeah you don't want to be uh, and, and it's often it feels like i'm not always as close to the action as i was before um so you do have to make a bit more effort to kind of um get in with the artist and obviously they they relate to you differently now that i'm a production manager people relate to me differently i think uh, i was i think they felt a bit more safe when i was a pa or coordinator back in the day but now i'm a production manager and they definitely relate to you differently but what i've been doing during lockdown i've been trying to have uh, one-on-ones with some of the people that i'm working with which has helped uh we we tend to have our kind of a uh, daily uh, meetings where everyone kind of comes in but having time to have one-on-one stuff and not necessarily making it about the work that to find out what, what's going on in, in their kind of personal life as well um that's been that's been really useful for me that's great yeah like getting to know your team as individuals i think yeah. is real key isn't it um and beverly like with the production manager as well it's not all, always just about the internal team you're more client facing in that role as well aren't you um did you find that a bigger a big change when you moved into the pm role i think it can be quite intimidating but you know as like amari says as a production coordinator you kind of feel like you're a bit more safe and i think funnily enough as a pc i just felt more bold with how i could come across and i just had to try and get back a little bit into that mindset and pretend like I know what I'm doing because I do know what I'm doing um, and then just you know t- tackle that and just be um, um, and clear with what your expectations are and, and to make sure everyone's on the same page. I think um, when, when you become a production manager one of the biggest differences as well is that now you're part of establishing the goals of the production and establishing common values with how decisions are made and how you respond to problems. So, you know, who should do what when, what principles should govern decision making. Um, so, so when your team grows in size, it matters less and less what your, your individual contributions are, like say an asset breakdown. It, it's not so important how, whether you personally are good at doing that yourself. It's more, you're more asking questions about how you can improve processes like uh, how can this meeting be more efficient or planning for tomorrow or nurturing a healthy culture because you want to overall improve the team's outcomes. Fantastic. Is anybody else, is there anything we missed on the difference between production coordinator, production manager? Role? Um, yeah, there was probably something I want to chime in. I mean, obviously there was the going from being departmental, but also I'm more involved in um, getting involved in things that aren't just internal but external, right? Like voice record, scripts, um, casting as well. It depends on, on uh, how your, how your, how the production company that you're working for, depends on how they're involved with the show of war, right? But being involved in that kind of, um, uh, that kind of stuff to do with the different vendors, that's been really interesting as well. Um, and then just learning how to manage coordinators and a PA, because um, I'm used to kind of being in the trenches, but um, just teaching them how certain things are done. Uh, and it does require teaching on some level. So yeah, that's been, that's been, I'm, I'm still getting used to that. So yeah. So uh, like diligent. giving over ownership to people as well, like, cause when you're- Yeah, yeah, it's, I guess on, it's, it's like knowing when to delegate versus when to do a task yeah. yourself, right? But after yeah. a while you do just need to sit down and, and teach them to do something. Um, and some things um, you can give them some leeway with, but other things you've got, some things you just need done a certain way and it's just gonna have to be this way and then they've just got to learn it, so yeah. Sorry, Rob, were you about to say something? I was just going to chime in with saying that delegating is, a, is an art form in itself. And that, that, that takes some getting used to as well. Yeah, yeah, I definitely remember that. That was my, my biggest hurdle, I think, like letting other people do things. That was a major control freak. Um, so what would be interesting now is to know, because, um, you know, around the UK, the, the range in size of studio is, is quite um, big. So do you think the role of production manager, how big the job is, varies depending on the size of the studio and how big the departments are? Because in a t- small studio, a production manager would have to span much bigger workloads, wouldn't they? Because there are fewer bodies. Um, I, that wasn't a very concise question. Hopefully someone can come in with a concise answer. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely does vary. And it's what I was going to say for anyone, I think, who's trying to get into this. I think working for a small company earlier on is probably better because you'll get to be across more departments. Um, I think if you come in um, new and you're at a big company, you'll be quite a small cog and you only get to see in one area. And, you know, going back to people talking about what Rob says about, you know, trying to learn as many departments as possible. 
um, you know, getting in somewhere smaller might be might be better early on. But I think at some point it is worth going to one of one of the big machines just so that you can um, see how how all of that works too. But yeah, definitely definitely varies. I think I probably have a I think I probably prefer the big machine, um, or at least like a mid size. Well, I haven't really, worked in, in in any of the big VFX facilities. Obviously, that's that's that, uh, 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 that's a different thing. But I've worked for like mid size animation studios, and I quite like that. So yeah. What do you think you like about it? Just out of curiosity. Um, I think I quite like everything under one roof that is useful when the company owns the full stack, right? That's, yeah. that's quite nice. Um, outsourcing is, is always good and it's good to learn that, but it comes with its own set of, of tricks, um, just to kind of uh, managing the relationships and time zones and getting used to all of that. And sometimes language differences, right? Um, but it, it is nice when everyone's just, it's just under one roof. Um, and just being able to, if you're across departments, rather than having someone overseas, if I can just yell across the studio at someone, <laughs> that's way easier, right? So there's that, yeah. Or not at the moment, yell across Zoom at someone. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say that um, uh, as much as the big or small studios make, make a difference, it's also, um, it's also where the activity is happening. So I've worked in like, you know, medium sized studio where, where things are outsourced or a small studio where everything is outsourced to a very big company um, or with, you know, a, a three way co-pro going on as well. And they all have such different demands um, that, yeah, I was just going to say it's, it's very different. It's very different in, in each, in each case for each production, irrespective almost of what the studio size is, because, Often, if the studio is a big studio, then there's going to be multiple productions going going through. And when you're a PM, you're generally just working on one production at a time, um, unless you're, you know, split across um, several developments. Oh, Bear, have you got anything to add to that one? Just yeah, just echoing it really. There's no template to these kinds of things. Um, roles vary across different. Um, different studios um, and also the number of production managers. We have a junior and a senior production manager at Gutsy Bristol, both working on the same production. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, in others, it'll just be one production manager over various coordinators. You can have line producers thrown into the mix as well. It's, um, it, it, it varies, but uh, it's usually, it's, it's keeping that overview that, that, that makes, makes the production manager role the, uh, what it is across across companies and even uh you know if you do multiple productions in one company every project is so different isn't it like you were saying you don't know which elements of the project you're doing especially if it's a co-production so you might be focusing on different areas with different projects and also the terminology if you're doing a co-production you may have to adopt the terminology that they use for each section like when i did my first Canadian co-production and they were sending me Leicas and I'm like, what is this? <laughs> like, um, and then I had to work out that it was an animatic. Uh, that's potentially showing my age. I don't know if these the term like anymore, but um, yeah, it's, it's a never ending learning curve, isn't it? It's, so you have to be really agile and evolve uh, all the time. So I think that's what's most exciting about the, uh, the role in itself. So one of the questions is about, um, at, at the moment, obviously, we're, I mean, Rob, you're in your studio today, but um, the rest of us are, we're all working from home. Um, how are you finding you know, managing teams uh, remotely at the moment? And do you have any tips on how to to do that effectively? And Amari, you've obviously mentioned having your one-to-ones with your team. But um, yeah, how do you make it work day to day at the moment? Let's go with Bev, even though you're on day one <laughs> of your job. <laughs> Uh, well, previously, I guess, I mean, it's difficult because you're, you, you know, like Omari and Tamsin were saying, you're taking out the context of the studio. It's just so much easier to walk up to someone and just ask a question. And if you have to ask someone in an email, it just makes everything so much more formal than it really needs to be or, come, or, or yeah, should be. Um, and I would say it's, it's, if you're at the very start of the production, it's really important to build a team that works well together. So it's quite important to develop trusting relationships with people to understand their strengths a lot more calls and check-ins both formally and informally to ensure that you know there's a mutual trust between people um you want to support and protect them as well as make good decisions about who should do what and coaching just coaching um everyone to to do their best um 
we used to have a a Friday sort of beer o'clock as well um, at about five o'clock where people would just or we just have like one big Zoom call and people would come in and leave whenever they wanted or go in uh, if they left leave if they have a meeting come back later if they want um, and that was that was nice too yeah, yeah we have a um, morning morning tea break together which is really nice um, oh. and uh, it started off for ages everyone was just comparing mugs every morning <laughs> And how you can see how huge my mug is uh, <laughs> when we had um, you know, a full team on the current production. Now we're down to uh, skeleton crews, which is sort of the end. Um, and I think just um, yeah, I got to know people's um, people's you know bookshelf and their and their mugs just from chatting to them every morning. And sometimes I would I would never you know be speaking to them. They were in a different department that I wasn't managing. Um, but it was really nice to get to know people. And then when lockdown sort of broke down, and we could have the odd drink it's really strange because you see people's legs for the first time um so i think building a, building a team up during a lockdown well during remote working at all is um has been more of a challenge than i think any of us expected um because you know you're used to work, working with some people remotely i remember you know up to five years ago i was working with somebody remotely who has a, had a disability and it was just easier for him to to work from home so everybody just worked around it so I was familiar with remote working, but I wasn't familiar with everybody remote working. Um, I think that's been that's been the challenge, and just making sure that nobody feels um, that nobody feels isolated, and that when we talk to each other, we're not just talking about work. It's not just an update. You um, you know, you're having uh, having those chats that you would normally have in the kitchen while you're making a cup of tea. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's been really important for everybody's um, you know, health, mental health during this last year. Yeah, pub quiz goes a long, a long way. We've had <laughs> many a pub quiz. Um, but I think the biggest, the biggest thing, like you were saying, Tam, about building a team remotely is communication has just been, um, it's just become such a, even bigger than when you're in the office where, you know, Bev was saying that you can just, you know, chat to someone. Now you've got, a, you're scheduling calls all the time just to catch up with teams and you're having just keep in touch with Slack all day long, um, but it's it's important because that you lose that office chatter, um, and instead you have to you 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 sort of become even more the linchpin <laughs> as production manager, just making sure everyone knows what they're doing and when. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that with what you guys are saying. It's um it's it's tricky, and and the one on ones have helped, but like specifically within that, I try to talk about things with people other than work as well obviously it can be tricky it can be tempting to even though you have those little breaks it can be tempting just to, to, to stay on work topics but you know I try to keep it I, I try to find out about that their, their, their personal projects as well um and one of our designers Joel's making a comic book and um you know I, I every time we have his one-on-ones I think we spend half the time talking about that stuff like we do get to the, get to the actual important stuff but it's, it's good to not just be kind of work focused all the time because um, that's that's that kind of stuff would have come up in the studio anyway, right? So it's just I, 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 I trying to keep it keep it like that, and um, and then yeah, messaging apps like Slack. You said Slack's my favorite. I think right now we're using uh, Google Hangouts, but um, those messaging apps are always useful. But you you also have to be a bit careful with them as well because sometimes people can get a bit dependent on them. But you know, it's a it's a balance. So yeah. That's yeah. So that you've mentioned Slack. We we use that too, and it's brilliant. Does anyone use anything? different just for that communication between the teams uh, google hangouts we use but um, i think slack is is my preference yeah so as we're talking about software let's go on to the software question of um so what systems do you rely on what software do you use and uh, so it's two parts and then have you been trained in it specifically or did you just learn it on the job Google Docs, for the most part, so many Google Docs, which is which is what I think has been has grown out of Excel was the go to one before this, but yeah, Google Docs. Um, we are introducing. Uh, you don't need any training on Google Docs, to do that. but um, a shotgun is something that we're introducing into our company. It's not something we've ever had before, and to be honest, not something I've worked with before. Um, but we've brought a very talented man in to start integrating it into our 
pipeline into our workflow and he is training us up as we go but no i have no ex previous experience of it but it, i already see uh, i had experience of it i should clarify uh, as tam would correct me but um it's uh uh it is it is a new thing that i've that I've, I've, I've never used in a coordinated job or anything like that so uh yeah we're learning as we go is, is it generally everyone is learning as they go or has anyone done any specific training I think, um, well, I haven't, I haven't done any specific training for it. So I would say if you can, as a production coordinator, learn as much as you can about it, even, even maybe during your time off as well to read tutorials, as boring as that might be, um, because if you can't get any training outside of work, um, that's really during, during on the job, it's the best bet you can have. Um, and I think for me, I was lucky that I was surrounded immediately from my first job as a production assistant by people who knew uh, Shotgun really well in this case, because I've used Shotgun for the last, for, for my entire career. Um, and people on Gumball knew, just knew it inside out. They, they had people that were integrating it into their pipeline and, you know, and so I could take that knowledge forward on to different productions. And I think what, what I've seen is that a lot of productions don't, give enough time to set up a workflow around a new software and it can it can be quite difficult to integrate within your within that individual studio um, so i would say when i joined aka i was the only person in the whole company that knew shotgun really really well apart from the previous manager who whose legacy i was taking on and that sense was also difficult because there was no there was virtually no handover um, so i had to under, tried to understand his thought processes when it came when it came to the workflow that he had set up, while de while development of the pipeline was still ongoing. Um, so I had and then had to try to understand what was working, what wasn't working, uh, to be able to you know action and implement areas of improvement, and and then still manage the production all, all the while as well. So, so it's a lot of reading. <laughs> exhausted just listening to that and uh, someone's just asked how how important it is to have a knowledge of something like shotgun do you think it's a real advantage to know the softwares before applying for jobs i, I do but i think it depends right because i mean I, I see it on job applications uh, and i think depending on the job it, it's slightly unfair i think if you're a pa if you're a production assistant or coordinator probably slightly unfair depending on the level of experience, because it's hard to have learned it before, right, to know it for the job. I think by the time you're a production manager, if you assuming that you've worked in series or VFX, yeah, I think that's fair then that you probably should know it. But um, there are some really good YouTube tutorials on the actual company's website, like right, for Shotgun Studio. So that's how I learned. It was mostly just um, kind of self-taught and then sh like sharing knowledge with people. Like I've worked with Bev on a few shows where we had it and Tamsin and, um, you know, you just kind of like share ideas and, and different things. But um yeah, it was it, it, um, Shotgun and then Google Docs and getting really friendly with them. Basically becoming like a spreadsheet jockey basically is, is always good. Um, and um, and then there's, there's, there's a software I'm considering now for um, managing edit called Frame.io. I find that managing um, animatics in um, Shotgun is a bit tricky, especially in terms of notes. So I think we might consider Frame.io going forward, but we'll see how that goes, yeah. In size of the um, production and size of the projects, is, or, or rather not even production size of the company, they may not have bought into, they may need a production manager with a lot of production experience, but not actually sure. got, don't actually have shotgun in place. Um, that sort of plays a part in it as well. So it's not, I, I wouldn't say it's hundred percent necessary, but um, I didn't, but it's, uh, but it's, uh, it'll probably, it would help your CV. <laughs> I think it's a yeah, good point because the small it's shotguns really expensive like it's and it's a per seat software so um mm. i don't think many of the smaller studios will use it as, i think as, the thing with shotgun as well is that you it's a few tutorials as well isn't isn't is only going to take you so far and being able to have a tinker around with even a, a trial uh, version would be helpful but not imperative to know before you come on to the role I think it depends as well what stage of production you come on board because if it's already established then um, you know there's not there's not much that you need to learn to try and improve um, 
in that sense. It's not as important to know how to create a, a shotgun pipeline in that stage of production, whereas like if you were at the very beginning. I mean, I, I have no experience of Toon Boom Harmony pipeline and that's what we're using on Dog Ears. Uh, but, you know, all, all softwares all serve the same goals. It's just they work maybe differently. They work better f across different uh, production needs. Um, and the, someone else asked about uh, production tracking software. Um, now, in my experience, most people just use Excel or Google Sheets to track. Um, does anyone use anything specific outside of that? Um, I try to keep it, so right now if I'm using a shotgun, I, I try to keep it all in shotgun, right? So we use it to schedule out the show, but also um, set up things, some, some custom setups to make it, to use it for tracking as well. Um, so I, ideally you keep everything in one place, um, which is what I'm trying to do, because uh, you end up with a bit of a mix of spreadsheets and say whatever software you're using, but ideally you're just using one thing, that would be much easier. So that's kind of what I'm trying to get to. I think probably most, most people end up using a combination of um, Excel where you really can't get away from it, um, Google Docs and, um, you know, an asset tracking software um, or scheduling software like you know, Shotgun or um, F-Track, somebody was mentioning Pipe as well. Um, and I think that they've all got, they've all got, they've all got good points. Um, and going back to your question about um, whether it's relevant to have on, you know, job descriptions, I kind of think it's, it's not because, um, it, well, for, for a PC, certainly for a PM, questionable, because if you know something, then maybe it's, if you, if you think you know about a program just from working on one production with it, which was, you know, for example, maybe it was set up for you, then actually that could have been anything. Working on setting something up is very different and working on making the, um, the tracking system work for your production and integrating it with different departments, where departments come in, where departments go out, or particularly if you're working with a service provider, where the information comes out of your studio and how it's going to integrate into their pipeline. Uh, that doesn't necessarily help at all. So um, it would be more on having good people around you to train you and show you what, um, what you need to know rather than having a knowledge of you know, of, of one use of a, an asset tracking software. So I would tend to not put that on a job description um, because I think it might deter people. And I think if it's not being integrated into university courses, then it's not really a fair thing to be asking people to have prior knowledge of. Otherwise, you're only looking for people who've already done exactly the role you're recruiting for, rather than um, embracing new talent into the industry, which I think, you know, is, so, is such an important part of, of all of our roles allowing people in otherwise you know you're not you're not training up the next production managers you're just <laughs> having seeing people go through their career in, in a you know, pipeline in front of you and i don't think any of us are about that we're all about making sure that people can come into the come into the industry can um you know we can all have a creative um, benefit together and produce some great shows at the, at the same time great so uh, one of the next questions is um at what point in the pipeline do you usually join a production? I thought that was a really interesting question. So, so I have joined at various stages, sometimes firefighting late, <laughs> late into a production, stepping into shoes, um, sometimes um, coming in at the beginning of a production where exactly where on schedule work where the production manager is expected to start and then you know the scripting process has just started pre-production has just started got a few designs but the team is all set up and then in other circumstances i've come in um uh on development and um right there at the beginning um working with the with the producers on the investment proposals and, and all of that so i think it completely it completely varies um and it probably varies more because um i'm now working in a smaller company um i think in in bigger companies then they would just be recruiting for that role and that's that's your start date um whereas with smaller companies maybe they're looking to to fill the gap between productions as well. So that's my experience. That it really, it really varies. Yeah, I think yeah, it's true. It does vary. I've, and obviously, my preference is as early as possible, right? Because um, I mean, um, I've got just enough experience to kind of know all the problems that are going to come down the pipe. So 
being able to solve those early rather than the kind of firefighting that you suggested is is, is much better. Um, but that, that is not always the case. So sometimes you kind of, um, in the reference I use, there's that scene in uh, Wallace and Gromit where the penguins lay in the track as the train's going at the same time. You know that bit, like, so if you come in late, that's basically what you're doing. But if I could have been in six months ago, I could have laid the track out first, get it all right, and then we can go ahead. But it's, it's often that, that Wallace and Gromit thing, so. You know. The difference is just giving, giving you that little bit more track. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, so that's it. But yeah, I, I did as early as possible. But yeah, if, uh, whenever they bring me in, um, I guess is, is, is it, yeah. I'm hoping you've all prepared a top tip for, for everybody that's listening. So um, one top tip for anyone who wants to move into the PM role one day. I think it would probably be wrapping your head around what the assumptions are as early as possible and um, keeping everyone accountable to them. So, you know, th somewhere the producer will have a list of um, how many episodes we're making, how many shots, um, how many effects, how many crowd characters you can get and get that in your head as a PM. And then you need kind of need to make sure that everyone is um, um, sticking to those rules as much as possible. And it's, it's okay if you go over somewhere, but that they need to pay the price and come under somewhere else, right? So it's about having a, having a, having a bit of a balance. But my thing would be um, staying on top of, of those assumptions throughout basically, yeah. I sort of my my best tip is the, is the one I already said earlier about um, kind of just take your time and learn as much as you can from from all the various departments. But I guess a, a practical tip is to, to is to keep a cool head. And a good a good thing during being a BM um, during a production is to keep a cool head anyway. But it's to I don't know. Think things will always come up. There there is no such thing as a plain sailing production. So things will always come up. And it's how you can take a step back, take some of the drama out of it and figure it out rationally um, is, is one of the best ways, I think, that you can maintain your own sanity <laughs> and the sanity of the production. I think that one of the top tips that uh, I would give is to, um, at the end of each day, allow yourself half an hour to make your to-do list for the following day. Um, for my process, this this allows me to close the door when I finish work and not think about things all evening because um, being a production manager is a very stressful role. Uh, well, all roles can be stressful, um, but I think there's a lot um, riding on your decisions every day. And um, to, to manage your own stress for your longevity, then um, to make a to-do list the day before just gives you that clarity of like, you know what you're doing and you've planned everything out um, already. So I use um, scheduling for myself um, in, within my calendar, as well as just looking at my, my block meetings. Um, and um, I think that that's my, yeah, that's my top tip. It just allows me to have that headspace um, that I finish the day and I look at my email to myself every morning and I know exactly what's in, what's in it and what's, what's to come, what the challenges are. I love that. I think I'm going to take that one for myself. Beverly, did you? So I, I, well, I, it's because I have a few and I was, I, and I was just going to add to what everyone else was saying. Um, I guess if you're hoping to move into the production manager role, I, th I would say be as vocal as you can to people about what your goals are, because if you're finding that you, you can't afford any training programs or if, if you maybe if you missed one or if you can't find any or you can't make it to some, I think, you know, you never know where you might learn something from somewhere, whether it's your current job or from other managers, from other coordinators. Um, so be vocal. The other one was to contextualize. I would say always remember that there is more to one side to a story and give everyone the benefit of the doubt as well. So someone said that most people focus on tracking software, but how do you handle the artistic management side of the job? getting the most out of your artists during difficult schedules and deliveries. I think that one's quite interesting because it is a fine balance, isn't it, between getting things done versus making the best show that you can. Um, any thoughts on that, Mary, maybe? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it is quite tricky. Um, so yeah, you've got a tight deadline to hit um, or a department's already buying schedule, how do you really get back on schedule or, uh, or make sure that you actually hit the, hit the deadline in the first place? And yeah, it's really, it's really, really tough. So um, I am a fan of breaking everything down into math. Um, so again, this goes back to what I was saying about assumptions, but also uh, department quotas and, and sticking to those because you want to 
know when something's slipping well ahead of time. If you've got a delivery up on Friday, you should really know by Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday whether you're going to hit that or not. So it's just trying to avoid it. And in the event it is, it's often more to do with um, flagging and letting people know that actually this isn't going to hit. Um, and what is, what is the knock-on effect of that uh, downstream, basically. So yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty tricky to manage, yeah. I, just, I would just agree with Amari and say it's all about communication and transparency. Um, especially if you're asking someone to do something that isn't ideal for them or some not something they want to do. Not everyone wants to go back and do seven retakes on something. Um, so you know, it's just just being as transparent as possible with people about what the expectations are and what's uh, whether something is possible to begin with. And if it's not, then um, something to take back to production to renegotiate. It's, it's mutual respect as well, I think. You, you try and build a good relationship with artists. Um, you know, you can't always schedule them down to the hour or down to the... So the best thing is to, you know, be honest and communicative of not only what you need from them but why and why it's going to be a benefit and what, what the long-term goal is. You know, try and be as open as possible to try and build that mutual respect between your roles. You love their work and you hope that they can j just sort of come on board with you and, and, and understand why you're asking these things. And if you can keep that, that trust between you and you keep that good relationship, then you can, you can get a sort of, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You know, it'll, it, it, you, can, you can get to a good place. Um, I think there's, there's two things that I would say. If, you're, um, if, you, if, if the artists feel like they're having a schedule imposed upon them that isn't really doable or, um, achievable with their creative goals then they're not going to feel as um as as much buy-in whereas um it, working on a, a larger project with um several artists and the head of department i would always sh talk to the head of department about that about the their departmental um schedule and negotiate that and see if they think that that's realistic and check in regularly that they're looking at the animatics and that they still think this is um this is realistic so that you're constantly updating um, your schedule and your quota demands rather than imposing a, bl a blanket um, schedule that you don't have any leeway. The artists don't have any leeway or the heads of departments don't have any leeway within, you know, for sometimes a two year project, it's just not realistic. So I think having that communication with, um, with the artistic teams, if not individually with the artists, is really important and that's more understandable for the artist for getting that instruction from their lead. Um, so I think, yeah, it just comes down to communication again. Yeah. Um, so someone's asked uh, what the most common problems are that come down the pipeline uh, as a production manager. So are there, is, it, is there the same thing that happens on every production that you need to watch out for? Um, I'll give two, <laughs> two answers to that. Um, working in 3D, um, the vast majority of issues were about technical issues, um, problems with the pipeline, problems with intersections, problem with um, texture layers not fitting onto character models, uh, constantly about, um, about technical issues, despite having you know, some of the, the, the highest class colleagues um, throughout my career I've been lucky enough to work with. Um, whereas working in a 2D environment, I think the biggest problem that I see is moving from a storyboard into an animation. Um, and I think that that's, that's often due to, um, due to uh, variety of issues, <laughs> varieties of issues. Um, but when you're moving from a, a drawn um, intention into a logical shot built um, environment it's um it's it's a very different beast and if people aren't working across that borderline then they've got very different needs and having the production manager look across that border and having the production coordinators look across that border as well really um really just helps to support that transition because i think that's in, in a 2d environment that seems to be the most problematic area for me great Anyone else want to add to that? Miscommunication is, is a huge thing. Get, uh, we keep banging on about communication, but and certainly in, in lockdown, it's get people talking. And it's, 
it's getting the getting problems nipped in the bud rather than letting them fester, hoping that they'll go away. Um, yeah, it's kind of echoing what, what they both said, but I think probably the most common problem I think I've seen is probably last minute changes. Um, so someone uh, someone creative has changed their mind about something at the eleventh hour, and now uh, other people, everyone kind of has to do a one eighty turn to try and and, and and get it done. And this is obviously this is obviously tricky and depends on on how senior that person is in the in the food chain. Will depend on how uh, whether it gets done or not, or whether it, or whether you can push back. But um, in some ways, I think it's worth it's worth designing a pipeline around those kind of last minute changes um, and to try to accommodate for it. Like you won't always be able to, but you want to, you want to build something that where you can move as quickly as possible if something does change. So it, it can be, it's, it's painful, but it can be, um, um, if you can design for that, it, uh, you'll, you'll end up with a better kind of pipeline and workflow. And then, yeah, um, um, solving the right problems like Rob says. So the, the, the reference I always use is um, symptoms versus bugs. Um, so I think when you're new, it's hard to know whether something is a symptom that will go away or a bug that will kill you, right? And as you gain experience, you start to learn that, oh, this will go away by osmosis and that big problem, if we don't solve that, that's, that's a cancer that will kill us, right? That, that, that comes with experience. So, um, and you, you'll learn that from working with good people and eventually you'll just, you'll, you'll just learn to spot what, what those problems are. So, yeah. Excellent. So, um, yeah, and I was just to add to what Amari was saying that that just comes back to what Rob was saying. It's about communication and miscommunication because sometimes, you know, um, a, a very shy artist might come up to you and say, I think that's a bit of an issue. But, you know, if they've kind of ha had an issue with five things before in that week, then you might be like, oh, okay, uh, what is it now? Whereas it's just so important to listen to every time somebody brings a problem to you and assess it with fresh, fresh eyes. So you don't miss anything. Yeah. Um, so just to touch on uh, what you just uh, were saying about um, you're seeing different issues in 2D and 3D terms and like, so how how different is it to be a PM on a 3D show versus a 2D show? And are the skills transferable or is there fundamental things that you need to know to jump from a 2D show to 3D? That's all, that's um, I moved from 3D into 2D and I, I, to be honest, I think that the transition in the other direction would have been much tougher. Um, the thing that I found harder going into 2D is that I wasn't working with a with a CG supervisor and normally that would be somebody that I was you know speaking to five to 19 <laughs> times a day um, and just really working alongside and um, to suddenly being the only person who's trying to inst instill any um, you know name protocol <laughs> file name protocols was a bit of a, a bit of a shock for me um, but um, but for me I had a career break, had a daughter, had some, um, uh, you know, time out, um, and then went into working in a 2D show. Um, so I, because I'd had a bit of a break and also had a baby, which, you know, you kind of forget everything and then you have to learn to be an independent person <laughs> all over again. So because I'd had such a sort of um, emotional transition myself, uh, I kind of felt like I needed to remember and learn everything again anyway. Um, I think if I'd gone from, you know, um, finishing a 3D show on a Friday and starting a 2D show on a Monday, I probably would have had more of a, um, more of a, a grating correspondence and, and uh, been able to work out exactly what was different. Um, but um, there were lots of similarities. I mean, I think the, the biggest differences between all the productions I've worked on have been more about um, the teams, the environments, and um, and the, the 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 production itself, rather than um, rather than the medium, the medium has made a big difference technically. What what I felt I could bring um, to a two D show was um, was maybe less of a to constantly technical check, um, but it hasn't made any difference in the long run. I do think it just took me maybe um, another month maybe to get my head into 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 the workflow so i don't think it's an impossible thing to move between two and as um a pc move wanting to move into a pm role i would encourage it because also it allows you to branch out into other into other industries into commercials into vfx and um 
you know, where there's in terms of job security, then you've got more of a breadth of knowledge. Any other thoughts on the differences? And obviously, if I've missed out stop motion. I'm not sure if any of you've got experience in that, but um, yeah, it'd be interesting. I've never worked in stop motion, so I don't know how fundamentally different and technically different it is, but um, any other thoughts? Uh, I've not worked in stop. Um, well, I did I briefly work on one stop motion thing, but it was a it was a short for a CITV. But um, I, I, it's best I don't comment or or speculate on that. I don't have enough experience. But um, yeah, in in terms of two D and three D, I think uh, yeah, you want to get a range of experience across both. And I find that obviously two D is a lot more technical and process driven, and there's there's, there's 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 a lot more process um, and kind of uh, strict pipeline requirements for things to work. Otherwise, things just break. Whereas a farm with 2D, uh, you could probably get away with just calling it a workflow, and it wouldn't. You don't really necessarily need a, a proper pipeline in the in the full sense of the, of the definition of pipeline. You, and I think in that sense, you can get away with a lot more, um, and it's a lot easier. But you know, if you move into a 3D environment, then you've got to get used to to, to farm and conventions and get friendly with the pipeline team and things like that. So, and it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. Um, just to add to that, it's it's again like what Tamsin and Mario was saying is understanding the inputs and outputs per department and and um, and, and general workflow because you know Gumball, even though I wasn't a manager on that show, um, you know that that was still a mixed media show, two D, three D, sometimes stop motion, sometimes live action, and each episode was very different in some ways in, in the necessities it needed. So the pipeline for each episode would be you know, very slightly different, but sometimes in, in very big ways. Um, and and while well, AKA was on a 3D film, which had 2D elements in it, and then, and as well as an animated insert, which I can't talk about, uh, but that was 2D with using 3D to comp. And it's just really understanding the inputs and outputs for each department and what the next department needs. So I, I think uh, quite a few people are keen to know if there is a template for scheduling. Uh, no, I think um, mine's kind of my accumulated knowledge from different production companies. So, you know, I work for some companies that have got some pretty impressive um, spreadsheet games. So I just kind of uh, adopted some of their processes, so to speak. Um, but um, yeah, no, there isn't some universal um spreadsheet that everyone's and I, w I would if even if there was I'd probably be, be, be reluctant to use it it's probably too old um I think if you ask some of the um some of the 20-year veteran producers there probably is an old schedule um and we're talking to one producer that said she definitely seen a certain schedule on different shows that have been passed around but uh that schedule I think is ancient so you so you might want to avoid that one but um yeah I think if you if you're lucky enough to bounce around companies you'll you'll see some best practices for scheduling and then you can kind of adopt that as you kind of move around so yeah yeah, it is, it is a bit of a dark art you kind of pick up as, as you go. And like Omari says, it, the, the more places you work, the more you'll see how not to do it. <laughs> and so, um, but the basis of any schedule is working out how much needs to be done, what the work is, and spreading that out so that you can, you know, so it makes sense to you and others of how, how, uh, how you're going to fit that into the time or how long it's going to take. Um, how you approach or how you do that is then kind of a, a little bit subjective, a bit personal. Um, someone's asked at what stage of the scheduling process should you calculate in holiday and sick days? I would put those into quotas um, uh, across the across the board. So that's actually been quite a problem in um, in the issue. In, an issue in the company that I'm working in the production I'm working on at the moment is that um, during lockdown people didn't want to take the normal amount of holiday they probably would have taken during that period um, and then everything bunched up at the end which is going to be a cost rather than a cost that's at the end of the production rather than a cost that's absorbed during the um, during the production but it's not fair on the team or the artist to go to them and say it's a kind of a cost thing can you take some holiday now it's not really fair so balancing that um, I think is is a uh, uh, one of the many challenges, um, but yeah, you should be looking at, um, at factoring in holiday at least, um, not sickness so much, um, into uh, into the production schedule right 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 at the beginning. Yeah, it's very it's very difficult to to factor in sickness, um, but just to echo that exactly the same situation is here with holidays, 
and it's um it, it's something that you really should factor in because it will come back to bite you in the bum if you don't if you don't prepare and, and not just in terms of costs people um people need holidays they need they need breaks and i think it's a it's a very hard part of our role to to see before people are getting to a burnout point and and talk to them before before they get to that point and ask them if they need a bit of a break um and because we're we're scheduling people as well as scheduling tasks and uh, remembering that and putting the little kindnesses into your workflow every day is is absolutely key um one of the other things uh, a few people are wanting to know is uh where they can learn about ske scheduling and budgeting and know that screen skills offer a few things but are there any other places that you could recommend that they can do courses or is it just on the job training really i'd say ask ask um, questions of people you work with the people who do manage that i'm sure many people would be more than happy to just talk you through or give you a little little um uh, tutorial of, of how they go about that no one's going to keep it close down I mean, figures in budgets you do have to keep closely guarded but i'm sure the process of it someone is more than more than happy to talk you through um but other, otherwise yes there's there's screen skills as well um, yeah there, I, th I think people have been sorry. sorry during my career i think people um people i've worked under have been incredibly generous in their time in answering my questions and sharing with me that their experiences and their and their skills and that's really helped me with um with budgeting and scheduling um whether it's you know replicating a schedule that, that i've liked and just stripping out all of the relevant information taking that forward to um to future productions or or just learning to not to not do effectively rookie errors like if you're showing your superior a production um, schedule and you um, you leave gaps in because you that you those are the areas that you want to put your retakes into fill in the color <laughs> because other, they're just going to say oh that's a gap take it out um, and try and squeeze it up give yourself some breathing space um, but that's more of a scheduling tip rather than how to find a schedule there isn't there isn't a, I don't think there's a there's a template schedule because all productions are so different you know if you need to put a 2d into a 3d show you need to schedule that differently than than if you're making a short. I mean, there's, there's no end of um, variations. And what if you're not in the industry? What if you're not based in a studio with people to learn from yet? Um, how do you do that? Like, how, how do you move in and learn the skills that you need to? Uh, would it be training courses or do you have to start from the beginning in a studio? But there's that producing animation book. I'm, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's quite famous. You'll see it on everyone's desk if you go into a studio. Um, I'm sure you guys have all got it too. Are you looking around for it? Yeah, yeah. If you've you got it, you can show it. I think I should you okay. mine years ago. Yeah, have, have yeah. Um, if you've got it, you can show it. I worked under bought it for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Same, same. And um, like I used to keep a copy on my desk. And like, yeah, that's the exact one I'm talking about. Producing animation. Yeah. Um, um, everyone knows that. Window. I'm yeah sorry. yeah yeah <laughs> the book. but it, it, it is easier to learn in a studio but if you can get your hands on that book then um that's that's helpful too um and and also spending time with them team leads as well because um obviously they they're the ones doing the work so they have a different relationship to the schedule and the producers um having the kind of high level view right um and it's, it's always good to be cross-checking the schedule with them to see if what, what you've got is realistic um and then what what times instead about the buffers and the schedule you want to be clear where are the are the buffers in the are the buffers um, hidden in the time that you've got, or are they over and kind of separated out? I personally prefer to separate them out as a separate batch of time, because you you tend to find that the work tends to fill the time that you allow. So it's best to separate it out, I think. But and people uh, some people do it differently. So yeah. I've got a small little tip for when I was a production assistant and I was doing post production paperwork, and I think if you can't get your hands on that book or uh and if you're not in the industry it's a little bit roundabout but you can learn a lot by looking at the credits of any show if you just watch them you can look at all the different departments that are uh what they might have used what they might have outsourced how many people they would have needed just to make something happen um and then kind of just working backwards from there what do you like the most about your job uh, i i like production because 
um, I thought, well, first of all, I think my mind is more like attuned towards a production sort of mindset anyway. And I really like being able to see how things flow from one department to each other, how the story evolves, because the story pretty much gets rewritten with every department you go into, it moves into. And I like being part of uh, developing the workflow and the pipeline the processes. Um, so, you know, like I said, I'm always asking myself that question, even on here we are when I came in and picked up someone else's legacy, I was still, you know, trying to figure that out and trying to make suggestions of what worked and what didn't and just improve that. I, I, th I, I like problem solving. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, I can I can echo what what some of Bev says. I think uh, cheekily, I actually do like quite quite like being able to delegate work to my uh, coordinators. That's uh, first time being able to do that, obviously, because I used to be one. But um, yeah, um, so that way I can focus on. I mean, I guess it's like what Bev said about um, problem solving. I do like problem solving, but it's nice to be able to commit myself to the more difficult kind of juicy problems to solve, right? Because I think as a PA and coordinator, I was solving problems that were. Uh, kind of lower level, low risk, right? But I mean, it's nice to be involved in the problems that have a bit more stakes, <laughs> um, living life on the edge there. But you know, um, I quite like that. So yeah, um, and yeah, just having having a high level view and and being able to get involved in the show early, um, and just avoid problems that you've kind of already sent them up before. That that's that's quite fulfilling as well. So yeah, 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 kind of kind of the, kind of the same. I think yeah, just um, I, I you know I always wanted to get into animation and, and media in general and so just to to be part of, of making something something beautiful making some really stunning show is um it's it's a huge reward and uh, and i think just over the course of my career i've been able to you know sort of chip away at the stuff i didn't enjoy doing and take on the stuff i did enjoy and i've sort of landed up in the role that that i that i feel most comfortable in you know that you, you're not always going to Make the right move, but you kind of learn from from that. And I think uh, I just I generally I just love you know making busy bodying. <laughs> uh, yeah, similar to pretty much everybody. I think um, I do constant crosswords, games, puzzles. I was working in toy in toy inventing before um, project managing toy inventing before uh, moving into animation. Um, constant games so i just love the challenge i i think in um in production management you you're kind of trying to work out what the clues are before you can work out what the answers are and um i really enjoy that challenge um but most of all i think i just enjoy working with a with you know a constantly shifting but really great bunch of creative mad people who <laughs> i've I, i've rarely had a, a day at work um, across my entire career in animation where I haven't laughed my head off at something and uh, just seen something that's utterly beautiful that's come out of somebody's mind. It's just, it's just such a privilege to, to get to do that in your career and to remember that every day that you're not just moving numbers around on a spreadsheet. It's to, it's to produce something that's really incredible. Um, a couple of people have asked it, like when do you know when you're ready to apply for a production manager role. So someone's quite specific about how many years of productions should you have under your belt. So do you know when you're ready? If you've stayed within one company, you kind of get an idea of almost like a hierarchy of, okay, I feel like I'm ready for this promotion. If you're, if you're moving, moving around companies, I think in the end, it's just with, it's, you know, pouring over a, a job spec or a job description and you know making sure you've got a few examples in your uh, under your, under your hat to be able to give in an interview that that would back up that you can do what they need of you yeah i think i think the years thing is, is quite tricky um because it varies like you I, I know a few people that moved up the ranks really really quickly like one of the last producers i was working for was, was uh, 26 um which uh 25 going on 26 which is which is really young but you know, she was taken under the wing of someone very good, very early. And if I think if, if, if there were no, if someone truly just showed you everything from the beginning, I actually think that, that you could get there that, that, that quickly. Um, but for the, for the most part, it takes a few years. I, I, I feel like I probably could have been a production manager last year. I was a senior coordinator last year, but um, you, I just had to kind of wait, wait for the right opportunity to come along. Um, but I think spending, spending a few years as a PA and production coordinator beforehand 
is always going to be good. It's just so that you, you're able to look at your decisions through the lens of other people in other roles is actually quite important. So how are your decisions going to affect everyone in the food chain? And if you haven't done those roles or haven't done them thoroughly, uh, you, you, you won't have context for how what you're doing is going to affect them. So that's, that's quite important. It's, it's always important to remember that your career is long and that it's um, ideally, and it's, uh, if, it's some, if you have a passion for production, if you work hard and if you, if you show dedication, you show the right people what you, what you can do, then you, you should eventually get to the, to the role that you, that, you've, that you want. And if you're working up to production manager, just be, maybe you get passed up a, a couple of times, but it's not to say it's never going to happen. And so it's, it's more about just getting that experience because, you know, you, you want to be in this industry for a long time. And so there's plenty, plenty of time to get to where you want to get to. I would, I would agree with... Um what Amari and Rob are saying. I think for me personally, I like to be able to have a really solid grip on something before I move on to something new. And um, my last role as a, when I was a coordinator on 101 Dalmatian Street, I think by that point, halfway through, I knew I was, I could do coordinating like the back of my hand. And also the show was so difficult that it was basically like the fighting montage in, in a film. It's like really just battering away at you, preparing you for the next stage. And I think um, I'm, I was happy to leave at the time that I could with the opportunity that was presented to me. I was very lucky to have that because I was ready to move on at that point. I really think it's quite different for everybody. But I think um, when I was on Dalmatians, I didn't make it very clear to my production manager that I this is what what I was trying to do next this is what I was looking to do next and is, was there any way that I could be involved over emails or within meetings that I could that so I could shadow what he did um was there anything more I could be doing for the department for my individual department that would help train me up to what um production manager tasks would also involve um but then you know on the bigger scale so for me it was just always being really vocal with what I wanted to do making it very clear that you know, I haven't got experience with it, but I feel like I'm ready. And if I'm not, I would still like to try and work my way up towards it and see whether that is something that would be right for me or not. It's great. And there is something quite infectious uh, about people who want to learn and progress, I think. So I think asking that question and making it clear is definitely really important. Someone has put, would you like to be involved in the new spitting, spitting image series? I don't know what that's connected to. I don't know if that was for an individual speaker or so if that is uh i know the show yeah yeah um um it's that it's it, it was on ages ago and now they just brought it back but yeah spitting image is really cool i'd i'd love to work on, on something like that at some point it's a it, i think it's a puppet show right so yeah cool uh, it was it was originally yeah. yeah most important thing you think a production manager should be responsible for so i'll make this the last one um uh, i'll i'm I think that was thinking um, I think it's uh, it's it's really important that everybody that the team that you're working with through through the whole production come out at the other end having learned something from each other as well as produce something great. And I think coordinating that and making that happen and how that how the structure of everybody interweaving that's the responsibility of the production manager, and that's. Um, that's an honour to do, and, um, and I've seen some, you know, some great relationships and ideas come out of, um, of productions that I've worked on, and I'd like to think that some of that was from me having suggested co-working that maybe wouldn't have naturally been the, um, the natural flow of events, and I think um, how you get people to work together is just, is just the main responsibility, I think. Yeah, I like that. I think my, mine's that was that was the kind of uh, quite human oriented approach. Mine, my approach is slightly more cold, <laughs> but um, so I've just given that as a before I start. I think that the three most important things are recruitment, cash flow, and delivery. And I know that can sound ice cold. I didn't talk about story or culture or people, but um, if recruitment, cash flow, and delivery are kept on top of because they're all connected. Uh, you should be able to keep everything in check. Um, recruitment, you've got to bring in the best people and hopefully nice people, and cash flow and delivery are linked, right? So if you don't hit certain milestones, you're not going to get paid by the client, um, and then you're going to have um, not very happy people. And uh, delivery is just is 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 kind of the game. So yeah, my advice. I'm reading this book uh, that's 
that's uh, putting management into context for me as well. And it's called Making of a Manager by Julie Chua, with the, which is spelled Z-H-U-O. And she condenses it down to basically just three things, and that's purpose to make sure everyone has the same, is on you know has the same goal, um, and it's very clear about what the goals are. People, so you you're making sure you're building up the best team that you can possibly have, as well as looking after your team, and process, which is making sure that the processes that you have in place are efficient, to serve the purpose of the people and the, well serve the people and the purpose. Thank, uh, that's all the questions. So thank you so much, uh, everybody. I mean, it was fascinating for me. Um, so I'm sure it was for uh, the many people that have been listening to us waffle on for a while. So yeah, thanks so much, Sue Ann, and to, to all this brilliant panelists for being so honest and to giving us all their top tips. Thanks, uh, Beverly, Amari, Rob and Tamsin. That was really brilliant. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good evening. Take care. Bye.